focus on probabilistic learning. Experimentation is not to ship, it's to learn. And there's a very nuanced distinction, but it's a very big one. Like if you're focused on just experimenting as a precursor to shipping, you're not actually thinking about learning. Like if experimentation tells you that something's good, it also tells you that something's not good. And also not shipping is something that is something new that you've learned. You tested, then it works, you learn. Hello and welcome to Experimentation Masters, the leading resource for business experimentation. Join fellow innovators, strategists and entrepreneurs to learn practical tips, methods and techniques from world-leading experts in experimentation. Design better experiments, lead with more confidence and have greater impact in your organization. Now please welcome your host, Gavin Bryant. Hello and welcome to the Experimentation Masters podcast. Today, I would like to welcome Rohan Kadial to the show. Rohan is currently product manager at Facebook Meta, working in the new product experimentation team with a focus on helping creators monetize. Prior to working at Meta, Rohan was a product manager at Yelp, where he grew request a quote by 25%, leading to more than 500 million in services revenue. He was also responsible for building and scaling the Yelp experimentation program. Rohan's approach to democratizing experimentation is a subject of a Harvard Business School case study. In this episode, we're going to discuss how Rohan successfully built the experimentation program at Yelp from the ground up. Welcome to the show, Rohan. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Gavin. Okay, let's uh, start uh, with your background and your experience. Can you provide us with a, a brief overview of your background today? Absolutely. Um, I grew up in Delhi, India, went to school there. I uh, majored in CS uh, design. Uh, during my time there, I co founded a non tech focused nonprofit called Find a Way to help uh, uh, to help protecting income, stream, income streams for, to fund education for underprivileged kids. Did that for about three years and then uh, moved to the US for grad school, went to Georgia Tech, go jackets, uh, majored in uh, CS and design again. Uh, Full time career, always been a PM, started out at Yahoo in the new products team, where our job was to bring Yahoo back to life, did not succeed. Uh, and we moved on to Yelp. Uh, then I moved on to Yelp, where first I was the PM for experimentation, built out that experimentation platform, program, scale the practice, and then shifted gears a little to work on to um, use that experimentation knowledge onto a specific product, where I helped grow Request Code, which is Yelp's uh, home and local services marketplace, uh, Yelp's primary uh, revenue generation uh, mechanism. And then did that for a couple of years when I was back in India at the beginning of COVID, saw people use WhatsApp in an extremely creative, in extremely creative ways to sustain their business and generate more leads. Got super excited about that. Came back to the US, met a bunch of super exciting and smart folks on WhatsApp, ended up joining WhatsApp to work on click to uh, WhatsApp growth, which is WhatsApp's business messaging offering. Uh, did that for about a year, then helped set up a similar growth effort for Instagram and Messenger. Uh, what business messaging and as a very did that for about again took three four months to help set up the team the charter uh, help kick off the execution on the team and as of very recently I have joined NPE which is new product experimentation which is Facebook's uh, experimental products arm we're building a new product called Super which is a tool to help creators monitor uh, generate directing income stream awesome so thinking back to Yelp when uh, you were leading and building the experimentation program there, how did that opportunity come about? Yeah, um, how did that opportunity come about? <laughs> Honestly, I wasn't particular. Like I had done experimentation and been a part of the process, but I never thought about experimentation as deeply. I, I was taking stats classes during my engineering major and like been through this process of what is what are p-values, like why is it important, who experiments. But before I started and like doing bits of internships, like in my head, experimentation was only for like medical books, right? For making like, uh, you know, pharmaceutical drugs and like how do you do different tests? I think 
uh, this entire over the last two years, a lot of people have become familiar with medical testing, especially because of the COVID vaccine process. That's what my perspective was. Only when I started work, working is uh, like doing experimentation and being a part of the process is when I realized like how it's used in day to day and how it also helps people make decisions and takes the guesswork out of decision making. Uh, and Yelp was a product I'd been using for a while. Uh, I had to find like plumbers, electricians, and also like restaurants. Uh, I was one of the few people who used it more <laughs> to find plumbers instead of restaurants. So I knew about the product, got excited about experimentation. When um, someone connected me uh, to, to the data team there who was setting up the experimentation practice, and that's how I got introduced to it. Okay, so uh, it was quite, uh, quite fortuitous and uh, you really just uh, followed your nose and an opportunity was uh, arisen. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I would say that. I wish I had a more grand story that I was always like looking for that and I was always seeking that. But yeah, I was, uh, you know, just went out, talked to a bunch of folks who pointed me towards other smart people and it, uh, there was a match. Fantastic. So thinking about... Um, that achievement of establishing and uh, and scaling the experimentation program at Yelp, where does that rank in your career achievements today? Oh, I'm super proud of that. Uh, it's 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 like it's hard to like place it. I think it's been a pretty it's been pretty uh, it's been a key to how like I've done things after the fact. I think it's given me a, that experience uh, helped me. I take a deep dive, not into just the statistical side of experimentation, but also the people side of experimentation, which is often overlooked. There's a huge people element to how you experiment. I could give you the best infrastructure that exists. I could give you the best tech that exists, but people mess up, right? Like people make the wrong decisions, interpret data the wrong way. That part, I got, I got, I got to do a deep dive into that as well. I think that was personally for me one of the most exciting parts of that experience, like learning more about the people side of experimentation, and that. I've used that and applied it to like everything that's happened afterwards. All the growth work that I've done, all the experimentation work that I've done. Um, yeah, I would rank it pretty highly. <laughs> it definitely makes my top three. So do you think for, from that perspective as a PM that it's it's the learnings that you took from establishing the program, it's maybe broadened your perspective to PM a bit more to, to uplift and and up quite more on the people side of change? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. First, I get this broadened perspective. It's uh, also like it helps you think about growth uh, much better. Like growth is, uh, I think growth is a game of inches. Right? Like growth is like you, you, you build, you learn, you iterate, you build, you learn, you iterate. And getting to understand that people side of thing helps you uh, sort of build that muscle, like build, measure, learn muscle and apply that to your day-to-day -day on how you think about like structuring a growth program and also how do you structure like execution? Yeah, uh, I think those are like, the, those things were my key takeaway, two key tactical takeaways from my experience on how to apply that into, the role, into my all my roles going forward. Mm -hmm. mm, good point. So thinking about uh, your time at Meta now and uh, thinking about your time back at Yelp, what are some of the key differences you know with experimentation between the two organizations? Yeah, uh, great question. <laughs> very, very different experimentation practices. Fundamentally, both follow the build, measure, learn cycle, right? Like that's what experimentation is all about. However, when I started out at Yelp, it was a very different experimentation landscape. There was, it, there was extensive, it's not that people weren't experimenting. People, there was extensive experimentation at Yelp. Several types of tests were being run, but all of these tests were being run in silos. There was limited cross-team intelligence. There were not as many guard drills in place. So you, we were very much dependent on people for making decisions and data science to do a lot of ad hoc analysis. Now, Switching gears to Facebook, Facebook's been doing this for like much longer than Yelp has. Facebook's experimentation practice is exponentially more mature than uh, uh, Yelp's was at that point, and arguably still is. It's a much bigger investment for uh, Facebook, given its scale. And because of that, uh, there's data governance, there's centralization. 
Uh, I'm sure at some point, Facebook didn't have all of that either, but I just haven't experienced that at Facebook. So at Yelp, the experimentation practice required handholding, processes, more culturally, execution. Facebook, everything already existed. And it's very, very robust. Right? They're like office hours, people helping you out. There's like on point engineers, the infrastructure is always up. It's a large scale, they are in the like large scale infrastructure. There are all sorts of guardrails in place. You get like centralized metrics, your product specific metrics. So, first and foremost, the maturity at both these places are very different. Now, fundamentally, on how both companies develop products is very, very different. Yelp likes to go more deep on product and like, I think people, and so I, I've, my experience is a little biased, you know, because the gro- uh, I've been focused on like growth, uh, mostly on growth at both uh, organizations. And obviously, like, my, especially at Facebook, microcultures exist. this, so there are differences uh, throughout. Yelp's experimentation approach was uh, culturally integrated by educating more people and helping people understand what everything means on, let's say, a scorecard. Like, what is p-value? Like, how do you interpret it? Facebook's approach was we want to we want to have bias for moving fast. So instead of like educating, having programs and like all of that jazz, we're going to make the tool where the tool helps you interpret the data as well. So I, the annotation is the same. Everyone same speaks the same language at like Facebook when you look at the tool. Red is bad or like green is uh, good or like, you know, if it's in this much, it'll tell you this is statistic versus this is not statistic. The, if we you can look at the p-values and you can get as much detail as you want, but you can also like run without getting into that much detail. So Facebook's all Facebook's infrastructure almost abstracts away the complexity to help you to move faster. Whereas Yelp was giving people, uh, giving the people more control, more details, and leaving it to people for interpretation and focusing on educating people. Mm. Which I bet is also a function of where the maturity uh phase of experimentation infrastructure are you? If I had more people when I was working at Yelp, if it was a more mature offering, sure, we would want to abstract away the complexity as well, right? Like as opposed to like educating people is harder than like <laughs> building a better product and like, I guess, like making the decision for them. Yeah, that's a good overview that uh, Facebook is probably uh, uh, a 10 to 15 year head start on on Yelp and uh, its, its processes, its systems, its culture, its platforms are uh, indicative of that level of maturity. This next question I like to ask uh, all my guests, I like to you know, understand that their thinking approach, their principles and their mental models. Based on your time in experimentation growth, have you formed any key principles or, or mental models that you now work to? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> for specifically for experimentation, I think some of the things that come to mind uh, and also, I think generally they apply to like scaling team practices as well, but more specifically to experimentation. One, you might hear me say that say this, or might have already heard me say this multiple times. It's not about the tech; it's about the people. Like, focus on people. People are the key part that make or break the infrastructure, whether it comes to growth or experimentation. Second, the standardization. Standardize how people test, standardize how experiments are created, how experiments are communicated, how experiments are interpreted. If different people don't speak the same language, you will not be able to scale an experiment if people are always trying to align on like, what is this metric? What is this dashboard? What does green mean? Third is focus on probabilistic learning. Experimentation is not to ship, it's to learn. And there's a very nuanced distinction, but it's a very big one. Like if you're focused on just experimenting as a precursor to shipping, you're not actually thinking about learning. Like if experimentation tells you that something's good, it also tells you that something's not good. And also not shipping is something that is something new that you've learned. You tested, didn't work, you learned. So focus on probabilistic learning. And fourth is always be testing. Like just keep on shipping, keep on moving, always be testing. So four things, focus on people, not the tech, standardize probabilistic learning and always be testing. So just thinking about uh, probabilistic learning there, do you think that the mistake that uh, some teams and organizations can make is that experimentation becomes a validation tool rather than a learning tool? Have you experienced that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah, firstly, you've hit the thing. It's like bang on. Yes, experimentation in a lot of situations, when, pre- when this practice is not done in a proper way, it is just a precursor. It's just a part of the process that you have to do, right? And, and there's a lot of reasons why 
this happens. It's it almost uh, in some places it's just a uh, firstly people are like okay, I egos come in. So you know, like I'm not I'm I'm smarter than this. I need, don't need to experiment. I've been doing this for a really long time. Everywhere is the same. This would work. Let's do it. So one is that like. But then you're forced to do it, so you do it. But you're not really doing it to actually learn and like, you know, take away or check your hypotheses or like remove your biases. And uh, yeah, I guess that's like <laughs> I guess that's like the biggest one. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, just focus. Yeah, but I think getting guesswork into decision making and like the ego aspect of this entire product development process comes into the way. And and then that scenario experimentation just becomes like a cool thing to do. Mm. Yeah, interesting perspective. Let's uh, let's jump forward a little bit and uh, talk more specifically about Yelp company and culture there. So you touched on a couple of these points uh, uh, earlier. What was the environment and landscape you were facing into at the start of the experimentation journey? Yeah. Um, when I started out, as I mentioned, like people were still experimenting. Like I or my team or like none of us introduced people to experimentation. Everyone knew about it. People were doing it. There were several types of tests. There was hacked together infrastructure, which lacked centralization. Because of that, everyone was experimenting in silos. There was limited cross-team uh, experimentation intelligence. If one team was experimenting, they didn't know like the impact of that on other parts of the product and you know, vice versa. Uh, analysis was really, really manual. It took, it took anywhere between seven to 14 days and required a data scientist or like an analyst to be involved in the process. So there was a lot of wasted effort. And all of this was slowing down product velocity. Okay. So thinking about the trigger then, what, what was the key trigger that moved the organization to rally around experimentation more specifically to, as you put it, increase product velocity? Absolutely. The biggest trigger was decision-making uh, decision making velocity. We wanted to be able to make decisions faster. We wanted to be able to ship faster. We wanted to be able to build a better product for a user as, and deliver more value for uh, the investors and shareholders of the company. And experimentation was becoming a key blocker in how we were building product and iterating on different things that we were building. Mm -hmm. Experimentation essentially enabled us to like accelerate our velocity and add more value to our shareholders and our users. And thinking about the role that leadership played in that transformation journey, can you describe uh, the role that leadership played in being that experimentation enabler? Yeah, the leadership was extremely supportive. Well, they'd already been in setups with different levels of data and product maturity. So they had experienced this. So put another way, they had like been there, done that at like a bunch of different setups where like, they had come, they had worked at the big techs of the world and they had worked at all the like fancy startups of the world. So they had experienced like having no data practices somewhere in between where you're trying to develop infrastructure to also be at a place where like experimentation is very uh, accepted, it's centralized and it's, um, it, there's a very mature infrastructure that exists. So given the, ex the breadth of experience that the ups leadership had, there was acceptance firstly on experimentation. It's a valuable tool to have. It's almost like it, there's no other way to make decisions. It is the fastest way to make decisions, right? Without data, everything's just an opinion. Uh, so one was that. So they were extremely supportive of it. They understood the importance. And it's, they supported us with it because they understood and they realized that having a solid experimentation infrastructure would actually help us deliver value faster. They supported us with investments. They'll help push for adoption whenever... I, we need, we were receiving pushback from different organizations to adopt move on move that uh, product development to a new infrastructure because it required some a little work on the beginning right to move to new experimentation interface. They helped us helped us with top down mandates, becoming evangelists for the program, and also helping us whenever we needed resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it effectively was the perfect storm. For change, then you had really strong leadership support. There was a, di a desire to change, to to transition from uh, an experimentation capacity that was uh, 
were somewhat fragmented and, and disaggregated to a, a high performing organization to make uh, decisions faster and to then stump up the resource and investment to make it all happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let's, uh, let's think uh, about some of those applied elements of uh, the experimentation transformation program there. How did the, the organization uh, structure the experimentation team or growth team? What did that look like? Yeah, um, the experimentation team. Uh, so we had four components to the entire, very broadly speaking, there were four components. Uh, to the experimentation infrastructure. One was called the beaker. Beaker was the experiment control infrastructure where people would go and create experiments. Then there was Bunsen logging. Sorry, the name of the tool is Bunsen. Bunsen as in the Bunsen burner uh, used in labs. So beaker was like, you know, the beaker <laughs> used in labs. Uh, so beaker was experiment creation infrastructure. Then there was Bunsen logging, which was the logging infrastructure, which record, which was needed to like compute, record all the analytics, what we use it do, what users doing, and these logs were processed, uh, uh, compiled and aggregated, and processed to come uh, compute the metrics. And then there was a scorecard. Scorecard was where all the experiment results were displayed, and the scorecard uh, interacted, uh, displayed outputs from a statistical package that we call BEAT. B E A T Bunsen experimentation analysis. Oh, I'm forgetting the first form. I've, I've, it's going to come to me. <laughs> I'm, the acronym's going to come back to me. But the beat package, which was the star cycle package. So there were essentially four components to this. Now, both all of these components is very had very close uh, required very close interaction between data. It was a close partnership between data science and engineering. Uh, the product team for experimentation was a part of the data org. The data org included uh, data science and data product. I was a part of the data product org, reporting into the head of data science. And the engineering effort that was supporting this was a part of the data infrastructure org. The data infrastructure org, they, they were engineers who were best equipped with the knowledge and the know-how to build this. Uh, and they rolled in to the director of uh, data engineering and data infra at uh, Yelp, uh, and these we essentially divide, and the, the beaker, Bunsen logging, and the scorecard, these three things were owned by engineering. The beat package, which is the statistical package, was owned by data science. And my job was essentially to you know, work with both parties and to make sure we build uh, what people need. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's touch on a couple of those points you mentioned there. The scorecard uh, is one area that really interested me. And I'd seen uh, a graph and some data that you'd produced that showed where the scorecard was implemented, the number of experiments in the organization increased exponentially. Can you talk a little bit about the role the scorecard played in increasing experimentation velocity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so ex- when before scorecard people were people had like uh, queries in the team uh, different teams had different data scientists who were running analysis in a different way uh, and people at different teams were rewriting metrics or rewriting the same queries again and again doing the same analysis again and again one is that it was leading to wasted effort because there was no centralization second a bigger problem was when two data scientists try to write the same thing, same query, it often ends up, mis- there's often a mismatch, which is actually not visible. Like one person might have defined active user as something else, but the other person might. And the difference is always like very nuanced, especially at a company of Yelp size, because there's 50 events that a user can do, which would make you active. One of them only ended up counting, let's say 47. The other one ended up counting like all 50 of them. So the definition of the metric changes. Uh, Second is there wasn't a common language for people to speak about experimentation. That was a big one. Every time if you would write up, uh, everyone was writing, uh, these these results were shared in Google Docs over email and people would like phrase them, write them differently. Every time someone would look at it, they would have to like interpret it, waste time having to look at like which part should I be looking at. And then every time you would present to an exec, you have to create another deck. So two things were the primary problems. 
not having the same language to speak about experimentation. And on the analytic tactical side, people were often using queries that didn't match or like results that actually weren't the same, even though they were calling it the same thing, let's say for this, in this example, active users. So when we lost scorecard, we essentially gave everyone a way to speak the same language. We essentially told, instead of having to write emails again and again, talks again and again, going and explaining your VP, why this met, what this metric means or like what this new metric means and having like other teams care about your metrics, they would only go to the, say, let's say I run an experiment. And if there's another team who cares about what I'm shipping, because it might impact their part of the product, they can only, they can quickly go to the scorecard without this new team coming into the conversation and just have a look at all the guardrails and all the checks in place and see if it's, you know, if, if this needs a conversation. So essentially scorecard, give a, by giving everyone the same language to speak about experimentation, it reduced the overhead needed to develop product. And this became a good enough forcing function for people to drop what they were doing before and move on to Bunsen and experiment because this just came out of the box. We just, instead of having to write, no writing, no additional analysis needed, it automa- it's out of the box. So this became a big value prop. And also when we launched the scorecard, uh, we saw a sudden uptake in experiments happening on Bunsen because everyone started dropping what, uh, whatever they were doing and they started moving on to uh, Bunsen due to their experiments. So to think about some of those key elements there, you talked about common language, visibility, transparency. Do you think overarching then it increased the the trust with the experimentation in the organization significantly? Was that the ultimate outcome? Uh, yes. Um, so I think trust was trust was a function of like a couple of other things. This is this gave people the same language to speak. Not necessarily trust. Reason being, we knew that when people would talk about, let's say, experimentation, and going back to the example I just gave about active users, people were using different definitions and we were auditing the experiments that people were doing, what results were they uh, making, and how many of uh, those, those decisions were actually correct. When I say correct, we did a meta, we did a meta uh, analysis where data science would like pick random samples of experiments and see if they agreed with the outcome of the decision that was made, why or why not. As a part of this process, we found out about different problems, what was wrong and what was, uh, why were people not being able to make uh, these decisions, uh, why were people making, correctly making decisions. So people didn't, in a lot of cases, people didn't realize that what the problems were. Like people didn't, be, this is data science because of the audit knew that two people made a decision by having a conversation about active users, but actually both of them measured active users in a very different way because we got both of their scripts, we audited them to figure out where the problems lie. So scorecard gave the, made it the value add from the, uh, the other team, product team's perspective was easier uh, with less work, less overhead on syncing with other teams, but not necessarily trust because they didn't know at that point that we were actually giving them the same language to speak. And it was, they were, they were, problems in that entire process beforehand. Mm-hmm. Good distinction. Just a quick question around uh, engineering capability. Did you find some uplift was required in the engineering teams? Uh, you know, formulating and designing experiments is a little bit different to day-to-day product design. How did that work? Yeah. Um, so with the, we, we, ha- we focus a lot on that as on, helping different we focus a lot on the process of where uh, different how, how, we we thought a lot about how different teams would onboard onto months what would that mean and what would that take uh essentially you required a couple of lines we we built an entire we built an api around uh this entire experiment, experiment infrastructure uh there were two pieces to this core api one was used to log one was used to Sent cohort users, which would enable logging for like different cohorts and different users. And the second was the beat, the statistical package, which Bunsen logging was used to figure out which analysis to do, which metrics to pull, and all of that jazz. So having by building two core uh, APIs and abstracting away of the all the complexity, we actually made it significantly easier for people to run experiments. Prior to this, people would actually have uh, to use their own. There was there was another uh, 
Bunsen, there was a different uh, cohorting infrastructure that existed, but that required a lot more work. People had, engineers had to write code, engineers had to like, you know, and do this uh, every single time. And they, it was, and there were also different flavors of the cohorting logic that existed. People would, for, engineers would fork it for their needs and develop a different flavor. There wasn't, no, there wasn't uh, any centralization. There were about four or five different variants of the cohorting in, uh, service, for example, that existed pre Bunsen. So we took all of that, we took the guesswork out, we built an API for you to just uh, qu- uh, quickly run experiments, add a couple of lines of code, here you get cohorting, you can quickly start logging things and the statistical package would automatically figure out, pick your logs and spit out results on the scorecard. So we actually made it really easy for people to run experiments. Mm. Yeah, the thing that uh, you've mentioned this a couple of times now, both at Meta and at Yelp, is abstracting away all the complexity to make experiments as easy and accessible as possible. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, figuring out patterns in specifically in DevOps and just putting them behind an API. If there's something that an engineer has to do more than five times, that's an opportunity for me. Excellent. Now let's uh, let's do a little bit of a deep dive on metrics. This is one of the areas that uh, I'm really interested to understand. Um, talking about the formulation of those guardrail metrics, can you talk us through the process and the journey to arrive at that outcome, please? Yeah. Um, before, to give you a little bit of uh, quick context, before Bunsen, as I mentioned, multiple definitions of the same metric, which caused a considerable amount of confusion. Um, but with Bunsen, we wanted, when we started building centralization with logging and stat, and now we had the opportunity because we had centralized analysis, we had centralized logging, and we had made it easy for you to talk about experimentation. Then finally, this gave us the opportunity and take this one step further and build a centralized metrics hub. That's not what we called it, but like that's just an easy way to explain it. <laughs> um, we had three categories of metrics at, uh, yeah, a decision metric, tracking metric, and guardrail metrics. Decision metric was why you experiment, what you care about. This is your goal. You, if this is what you will primarily use to make a ship or no ship decision or learn about the experiment. Second was tracking. Tracking metrics, these are secondary metrics around the core top line that you care about. You don't want, you want to see where they go. You're not negatively impacting them. You could potentially be, uh, they could be moving, but you don't make decisions based on tracking metrics. You make decisions based on the uh, decision metric. And this is also, because this is also factored into the power analysis. Like we're not, if we, uh, the more metrics you look at, the more, uh, you know, you need to get more data and it's going to take more time. So the the statistical uh, engine at the back made use of this piece of information. This is the decision metric. This is the tracking metric, and the and how many of these uh, exist, and how many you know how many uh, data samples do we need to get statistic results. And third were the guardrail metrics. I think guardrail metrics was super super interesting. Uh, prior, how the motivation for this was. As I, I mentioned uh, before that we did a meta-analysis where we would look at uh, experiments that had shipped and uh, whether data science agreed with the outcome of that decision or not. Should that have been shipped? Should that have not been shipped? And when we did further deep dives, in some cases we saw that an experiment that had actually shipped had had a negative impact in, on another team's product. And that team had never like found out about it because these metrics had never been computed. And some cases were intuitive, some cases were not intuitive. Now this, uh, with this, we started looking at like how other people or other companies have solved this problem uh, of like providing more transparency and visibility. And after having done a bunch of research on like looking at what other people, other teams were doing, when I see other teams, I mean like non-Yelp teams, other companies, uh, we came up with the idea of guardrail metrics for, in the context of Yelp. The, the idea behind this was that we're going to have top line company level guardrail metrics that the entire company uh, to, the chief, to the chief product officer level cares about. And these are metrics that no one should harm beyond a certain limit. Now, the, the essentially helping people define their trade offs. Now, in order to like actually evangelize this, we could build the logging and write the queries and like operationalize the metric. But there was a huge cultural aspect to this. Like, 
I can't just come up and say, everyone stop what you're doing. There's 20 metrics. This is what we all care about for like a 6,000 people company. Now, how do we evangelize it? First step was to get buy-in from the heads of all of these different product teams, the VPs at Facebook. How do you get buy-in from them? You, we took the, the audit that we did to different VPs to get buy-in to show them that how their orgs had been negatively impacted without any visibility to them. That, that got uh, attention from them. That got us in the room with them and this became a conversation with that point. After that, we devised a program where these VPs would tell us, the product owners of these orgs would tell us about the metric they cared about the most. They would become the owner of this metric and the spo- exec sponsor of this metric. We would build it, we would operationalize it. Now we've built infrastructure. We've got buy-in from VPs and VPs have sort of put a top-down mandate that we, every experiment as a part of the process, uh, as part of uh, the analysis process, we, need, we will look at cartel metrics to make decisions. However, now the metrics are being computed, but like there's like so many experiments running all the time. One team, how does one team even know this? Out of these thousand experiments, this one could potentially impact reviews or potentially impact like active users. Uh, then we build the final piece of the puzzle, which was an alerting system. If a guardrail was trending negative, a warning email would be sent to all the key stakeholders. If the guardrail had hit uh, the, beyond the accepted range, then everyone would again get a uh, email. And if it had, there was some, there was another limit defined. If I finally crossed the fully acceptable limit, the experiment would be paused till we get sign-offs from different parties to actually conduct the experiment again. Now, this was this was sort of a step back from what we had initially set out to do. Initially, the whole idea of experimentation was to increase velocity. But adding this guardrails and this experimentation, uh, this uh, uh, cross-team intelligence added more friction, which slowed people down, which was counterintuitive to what we were doing. But given the increase that we saw in the quality of decision-making, this is the trade-off we intentionally made. And when we started rolling out guardrails, initially we saw an increase in experimentation, but then we started seeing a decrease in velocity gradually till it's like splattered. But we saw a significant increase in the quality of decisions being made and it was a trade-off we were willing to make. Hmm. Yeah, interesting trade-off between quality, velocity and do no harm, right? Yeah. So thinking about uh, that metric submission process, how many candidates uh, did you have submitted when you're starting to consult with all of the departments for their, their key metrics? Oh, we let them define it. We got buy-in from them uh, on the on the revenue loss or like whatever they cared about. This is mm-hmm. the loss that potentially happened. And then we let them tell us what metric mattered to them. Okay. And that arrived at a set of uh, 20 or less uh, that we use going forward, Nine, correct? When I, last when I was there, but there were about 19. Now mm-hmm. that number might have increased and decreased. I'm not sure. But yeah, there were 19. Mm-hmm. How long did that uh, journey take? How many months? To build 19 metrics? To, to agree and align on the, the core set of metrics. Oh, about two and a half to three quarters. <laughs> it was a long process. Yeah. It was a long process, yeah. yeah. And uh, also, like, because after you agree with an expert, let's say you agree that you need a metric, you get sign off, then you start having conversations around, okay, this is what you said we need. This is what we have right now. This is the logging that exists. Now we need more logging. Can we do that? Okay, we can do it. Go ahead. Let's make it whatever couple of months. Prioritize, do it. Uh, if you come back, you're like, okay, this logging just can't happen. Then you go back and then you figure out what's the closest proxy to this. Then you go back again, figuring out the logging. So it was a lot of back and forth of mm-hmm. uh, figuring that stuff out. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's think about the the cultural transformation and cultural integration. I've previously heard you say prior to this podcast that that was the most challenging element of uh, of the transformation project with experimentation, and today we've uh, we've suggested that fifty you know, percent of the, the the job is performing experiments, and fifty percent is organizational cultural transformation. Can you can you talk us through some of the the key elements of the cultural change? Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I've been saying absolutely a lot. You can stop doing that, but. 
three steps. I think there were three key elements to this entire aspect. One was, as I mentioned, we went down the education route. We said we, given the size of Yelp and given our engineering effort we had, we could educate people faster than we could iterate or build and like do different things. So we started both streams in parallel and focused a bunch on education. That actually, I'll, I'll get into detail. That helped us a lot. But tactically, what did we do? Second was standardization. Uh, a big part of cultural integration is first you educate people so that they know what they need to look for. Second is you standardize them. So you give them a same way. Everyone's been educated. Now everyone needs to be able to speak the same language. And third was now you monitor if you're actually up-leveling and being able to do what you set out to do. So educate to up-level. We got buy-in from teams uh, to get to be like focused on experimentation education. The data science team developed an experimentation guide that uh, we saw we had like a mandate from VPs that everyone will have to go up, go through. And at the end of this, after you've done with this guide, there was a short, like, I think, eight, 10 question quiz that the, the data science has developed. Uh, the data science had uh, run up that all PMs had to pass when, uh, uh, who already were at the company. This was for all the existing people. Now, new PMs were joining, product managers were joining the company all the time. So this became a part of the onboarding experience at uh, Yelp. Yeah for people to go through this experimentation training. It was a pretty, it was actually pretty short and pretty quick, but just helped you make, uh, you know, uh, get at par with like experimentation practices at Yelp and also like help up-level people. Now, when this helped up-level in general, help uh, up-level the entire company with respect to experimentation and basic understanding of stance. However, we also wanted to create Bunsen evangelists in different parts of the company. To do that, we developed a four-week training program to train people to become Bunsen deputies. This, the, these people were essentially, for any Bunsen problem or Bunsen question, they were the first touch point in their own teams. They became Bunsen, this helped us, sorry, <clears throat> this helped us embed Bunsen, evang uh, Bunsen evangelists into key product teams, which helped facilitate and encourage widespread adoption of Bunsen. So this is how we tactically did the education. Now, coming to the second one, uh, which is standardization. Standardization was before, during, and after the uh, experiment, after the, uh, after the test was created. Before the test was meant, before when we the experiment design was being talked about or created, we created something called a PEP, a product enhancement proposal. It was essentially a template to how do you document the uh, uh, experiments, how do you think about hypotheses and how do you think about like power analysis and how, you know, metrics and everything. So it was a template that we created, uh, which was actually published as a part of the Harvard Business School case study and also has been used by several other companies for their practice as well. Uh, so people started documenting and thinking about experiment design using that template. It was like a checklist to make sure you've thought through all the things. During, we... Uh, standardized by adding months of logging, taking all, all the logging burden, the metric burden, and also by centralizing the analysis piece, the package. And third was after the fact, we already talked about it, the scorecard. Now you were talking about the experimentation in the same way. Now we had educated people. We had given them the tools to actually speak about it the same way. Uplift, up, uh, in theory, uh, statistical upliftment had happened. But now how do we measure it? To measure it, we start conducting a regular meta-analysis of past experiments to determine the proportion of experiments that were correctly designed and executed. This is the audit that I was talking about. And we initially, we did this as a one-time exercise to actually figure out what were the areas where uh, we could add value by building this new program. And eventually, this became the North Star of our experimentation product development process. And we started doing this every quarter and reporting it to execs. And it, we, uh, I think over the over the course of like one and a half, the first one and a half years, we, uh, were, able, uh, we, we were able to improve uh, the this particular metric, proportion of uh, correct decision, the decision accuracy metric that we used to call over two times. Over, we had 118, 118, 120%, something like that, some over 100% improvement uh, in correct decisions being made at Yelp. 
So I think cultural upliftment was a function of three things, education, standardization, and then actually monitoring and like measuring the des- uh, decision accuracy to see if things were, if we were actually correctly experimenting our experimentation platform within the company. If you were to conduct a retro for the cultural transformation, was there something that just didn't work? Something that didn't work. Um, well, something that you would advise other organizations, it didn't work so well. I think when I'm talking about this, it's seeming like this was a linear process that we always knew it was the people who problem focus on people and not in tech, like standardization seemed obvious. Like these were essentially our learning Then none of this was a linear process. There was a back, this was a very like haphazard, like circular motion. Oh no, this was not even needed. We invested like a month into this. This was like complete garbage. <laughs> Let's throw it out. We need to build something else. So we went through this back and forth uh, a bunch of times and we built uh, quite a few things that were actually, no one really like cared about or actually needed. Uh, I think one of the things was we built like automation for people to dimensionalize experiments, like split this metric by country, split something by, you know, some other country or like some other uh, attribute. But those those were so nuanced that one, people were not using it. Everyone always had more attributes than Bunsen already had. All of them needed more logging. So we didn't really think through this. And then we again went back and this was again, this comes back to the same thing. We can keep on building endlessly building tech, but like people's needs are very, very different. It's a people issue. Like people need new things. People are creating new products. So this dimensionalizing thing is not going to work. And this is sounding like a very <laughs> linear process, but it's not like standardization, education. These things were very after the fact. Like now I can say, yeah, it was probably a people problem more than it was a tech problem. Mm-hmm. However, if like someone was starting to build out their experimentation uh, platform, I think one thing I would say is like audit your current needs by looking at like four things. What is the volume? Uh, actually, three things. Sorry. What is the volume of tests that you're running and what volume of tests do you want to take the company to? That defines a large part of it. Like how much can you potentially, like if we, I was to give you the best infrastructure, can you really do a thousand experiments? Do you have enough engineers? Do you have enough designers? And all, you know, do you have the organizational capability to do it? Be real with yourself. You don't always have to build the best thing. Uh, sometimes good enough is good enough. <laughs> Second is uh, what is your required accuracy levels for when you're trying to make decisions on, uh, you know, medical COVID vaccine, for example, you need very, very high, like decision making, very, very high accuracy. But in some other cases where, there are some parts of the product which you're like reasonable. You want to be reasonably comfortable with making a decision. You're fine, like not having as much accuracy. And also in some newer products, you need to be honest with yourself. Like experimentation wouldn't help. Like if you have, let's say 10 people, you're building a zero to one product and you have 10 people on it. You can't do any experimentation. It's part mm-hmm. science. It's part mm-hmm. art. Go talk to people. Like you need a certain amount of scale for it to actually be worthwhile. You, you could be featured. You could be rolling it out instead of like doing A-B tests. And third is understand the company's existing data aptitude. This is also where that cultural and like ego aspect comes in. Like you want to be real with yourself. Like either people understand experimentation or data or people don't, right? Like, and like at Facebook, for example, Facebook and general product managers and even like other functions have very, very high data aptitude. So decision making and like these product decisions can be seen in the, how the experimentation infrastructure is built. Like if we don't, at Yelp, and oftentimes we might initially, we had to do like additional handholding as a part of the process. At Facebook, you don't need to do that. Like the data, app, the, that's just the nature of people who work at Facebook. Their data aptitude is high. Um, and after you've done this audit, I think it's useful to buy before you start building your own experimentation platform. Buying is way easier. There's a cost to buying as well. Buying is not free. It's not just money. You need active engineers, active data scientists to be handholding and helping people. But building is exponentially more expensive. It's like starting a new like business line. <laughs> Even if it's an internal product, it's a lot of investment in engineering, figuring out what to build and like doing these audits. So buying, initially, at least when you're starting out, buying is much better than building in my opinion. Mm, good point. One of the key things that I I took away from your summary there is that 
when establishing an experimentation program, you need to be prepared to experiment on your own experimentation program. That it's uh, it's a very mess- messy, ambiguous process. It's non-linear, and uh, th- there's no right way. There's only a way that works for your company, and you need to figure that out. So let's yeah. uh, let's finish off with our fast four questions now. Uh, can you think of uh, a series of experiments that you performed that shifted organizational thinking? or organizational perspective? Uh, from like product that we shipped or people started thinking about experiments in a new way? Yeah, thinking product side. Maybe some opinions or assumptions that wow. were, were busted. Oh, that's a tough one. I think uh, uh, at Yelp, it was definitely this idea of like uh, learning experiments. Uh, like be, it, Before we did that or we like evangelized this idea, people weren't shipping to like learn. People were always shipping to ship, sorry, experimenting to ship. The, this idea that you could do an experiment to just learn something about the user did not exist. But when I joined a new team, we were building a new zero to one product and we launched an experiment. Uh, and our entire goal outcome for that was we had two or three hypotheses on how users would react. It wasn't a new change, but it was educating a bigger change that we wanted to make. That was like a big, I think, fundamental change around uh, how people were thinking about experimentation. Oh, this seems like a good idea. We can use this for learning. These are cheaper. You can do painted door tests around this. And this helped, uh, often this helped people experiment in a quicker and uh, in a way where they could, you know, they, would, they could make lower investments. Good point. Number two, what are you obsessing about right now? What am I obsessing about? Uh, one is helping creators monetize their audience. That's become my day job. I'm super excited about it. See how we can do that. Second is, I don't know if you follow cricket, but the Cricket T20 World Cup is this year. So I've been <laughs> I'm eagerly waiting for that and see if I can go make it to Australia to watch it. And third is the price of Dogecoin. <laughs> I'm stressed out about that. These things need to go up. Cannot buy any more dips. <laughs> Uh, three pretty diverse uh, areas to focus on. Yeah, you got to keep it interesting. What are you learning about that we all need to know about outside those three points of interest you've just discussed? Um, um, one is like zero to one product development. This is my first role where it's truly 100% zero to one product development. This is the first time where I've been in a position where experimentation doesn't help. I just, we just don't have users. So it's a very, very new experience for me, which I'm super excited about. And I think everyone should like, experiment with this at some point. What happens when, you know, you just cannot experiment? <laughs> Your best bet is going out and talking to people, uh, which you should always, always do. But like when that becomes your only option, it's super interesting. Uh, so that's one thing. Second, uh, outside work, also just recently discovered uh, my passion for CrossFit, which has been super fun. <laughs> good, good challenge for you. So last one, so thinking about some resources, some books, podcasts, blogs that have helped you on your journey, what would some of those key resources be? What would my key resources be? A lo- there's a lot. <laughs> I'll talk a bit about general things that helped me, I think, get better at thinking about products and also the industry in general and how these things facilitate like better, I guess, almost better hypothesis for the test that you want to run. One is uh, Strategy. It's my favorite newsletter by Ben Thompson. It's just an absolute must if you work in tech. It's amazing. I make sure this is one thing I read every single day. Second is uh, something that I started reading more recently is uh, Lenny Ratchetsky's newsletter on, uh, again, product. He, he goes about weighty topics around marketplaces, product growth, like subscriptions. Uh, super interesting read. Uh, it's pretty good to get insight into how different companies operate and think about problems. Third is, I think, a very good, uh, it's more, it's an article more than a blog is uh, Building a Culture of Experimentation by Stephen, if I'm not butchering his name, he's a professor at Harvard Business School. He talks a lot about experimentation on his social media and does a lot of uh, work in the field of experimentation. It's a super uh, super uh, interesting person to follow if you want to learn more about experimentation. Uh, another one is 
good experiment, bad experiment by Farid the Masavid. It's a, I, I hope I'm not butchering his last name. He, it's on the Reforged blog. Uh, it's a very good uh, note on what constitutes a good experiment and bad experiment. He also run a experimentation program, or used to run, I think, for Reforge, which I've heard really good things about. Uh, and, you know, the final one's like a plugin for, you should check out the Yelp experimentation HBS case, where we documented everything that we did in uh, more details. Awesome. Thanks so much for those. Let's leave it there. We're out of time. And thank you so much for your time today, Rohan. Great chatting to you. And thank you for the insight and all the detail. Amazing. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you for having me. It's just super fun. That's all from this episode of Experimentation Masters. Just one more thing before we say goodbye. We can use your help to keep improving the show. If you have any feedback or suggestions for future episodes, you can email at gavin at firstprinciples.ventures. Visit firstprinciples.ventures for show notes, resources, and information. If you enjoyed this show, give us a share on social media. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. Experimentation Masters. Lead with more confidence.